Probably you all never thought much about the fact that I'm actually a small business. Unlike retail and martial arts, it really doesn't come up that often. But from one small business owner to another small business owner, I'm asking you to support Honor Athletics in Georgia. So how would we support them, Landon? Thanks for asking, Sensei Jackie. To order, call for personal service at 770-945-5150. You can also order all your karate needs and more online at honorathletics.com. And don't forget, when you're checking out, make sure you give the code WILDCATDOJO to get your 10% discount. So thanks so much for supporting us. We really appreciate it, Honor Athletics. And everybody in the audience, thanks for going out and checking them out. We appreciate that as well. On with the show. This is Wildcat Dojo Conversations. Welcome back. I'm your host, Sensei Michelle. And today, of course, I'm with Sensei Jackie and Landon. Hi, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. And today, our guest is Sensei James. Sensei James trains with Master Brown in Briar County. He's a Sandon, which is a third degree black belt, and he started karate as a child at only 11 years old. I'm sure Sensei Brown is so proud of you, and we're just so happy to have you here. Thanks for coming. Us, oh, thank you for inviting me, Sensei. Oh my God, I'm a little bit excited about this because not only are you here as our guest, but we also are going to talk about three, not one, not two, but three master swordsmen. Obviously, we're going to talk about Miyamoto Musashi. But then that led me to Boku Den, who was his alleged teacher. And then finally, that led me to his most famous fight with Sasaki Kajiro. Now, I know we're not going to get all the information I have here into one podcast. So when we fill up the time, we'll stop talking. Yes. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) That's how it usually goes. Okay. Let's start with the artwork. If you Google these guys, they have the coolest artwork ever. I do love the old artwork. It is it is really fascinating to look at. Yeah, just Google any of their names. I know you have, Landon. Us. The art was very interesting. And if you heard in an earlier podcast, Sensei Jackie made the joke that they must have had great publicists. And I believe that was true because somebody did just some cool artwork on them. I think so. They probably hired someone to go with them and draw as they were in action. <laughs> Like these days, they have a a photographer that goes with them. That's right. I don't even know if it was that old, the artwork, but I mean, some beautiful, beautiful stuff. Okay, we're going to start with birth and death dates for all the players. And Landon, I believe you've got that under control. Oh, sensei. So, Mr. Sukahara Bokuden was born in 1489, but died at the age of 82 in 1571. His supposed student, Miyamoto Musashi, was born in 1584 and died at the age of 61 in 1645. And Sasaki Kojero was born in 1583 and died in the battle with Musashi in 1612. Okay, guys, if you were listening, then you can see that although many, many sources tell us that Buko Den was Musashi's teacher, that really couldn't be true because Buko Den died before Musashi was born. And this brings us to a really important point. All of this stuff is truly ancient, and we're only going to be able to share with you what we can read these days. But we'll do our best, and to that end, everything we're saying has been found in some different sources. We always use Wikipedia. We always use the Google search. What else have we been looking at, guys? I've been using the history of Japanese art. It had some fascinating things about the warriors. And I'm going to mention mine when they come up my other sources. Otherwise, it was just my usual traditions book, the usual ones that I use all the time. A sensei. Here, we're going to start with a couple of Bokuden facts. Did you know that he never lost a battle? According to the sources that I read, he was the most deadly samurai of his day, even though, like I said, he died before Musashi was born, so they weren't in competition with one another. And he lived as a true samurai. He was loyal, noble, and ready to die. And we have now published the Moral Code of the Samurai, so you can go back and um, look at it. Us. Okay, James, why don't you take this last one? Us. Later in life, he developed a philosophy that there is more merit in avoiding conflict than there was in fighting and killing. And so that does seem to be a trend with a lot of warriors 
I think so. They, they realize that there's much more merit in avoiding than fighting. And we've been over that. Gosh, how many times do you think, Landon? I think a lot. And what I find is interesting is that I feel like we always come back to say, oh, I wonder how many times we've talked about it. If technology was only so amazing that we could type in a word and it would tell us how many times that we've said it, um, that would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool. Yes. And, and we don't want people to start thinking they're boring and we're saying the same thing. We come at it from a different angle every time, folks. Us, definitely. Okay, let's move on to Kajiro. First off, I found him very, very fun to read about. And I read about him in a site called Swords of Northshire, all one word. And doesn't that sound like a Hobbit site? It does. I I know. (laughs) (laughs) It does. It's not my fault it sounds like a Hobbit site. So you see Kajiro coming up from the Middle Earth. He would have to play the Gandalf character, in my opinion. Oh, Jackie just gave me a dirty look. I guess I she's a funny. Gandalf fan. Okay. All right. Again, you're with the part where it's just ridiculously difficult to find accurate information. And specifically on Kajiro, very little was archived, something that I found interesting because he was just as famous as Musashi in his own way. But here's what we found in no particular order. There is a movie, I did not look it up, but I'm going to someday, called Sasaki Kojiro. And it was made in 1967. So I guess we should try to catch it. He was born during the Azuchi Momoyam period. He trained and fought mostly, though, during the Edo period, also the Tokugawa period. So you're saying the Edo period was also known as the Tokugawa period? Cool. I didn't know that. And I'm not totally sure on that. I want to look that up. Why don't you look it up right now while we keep talking without you? Uh, By all accounts, he was a master swordsman. According to one of the sources I read, Musashi was kind of not happy of what a great swordsman he was. And so Musashi went to the daimyo of Kojiro and said, I want to fight your man. Really? And Kojiro had to go. It was an honor thing. Even though they were both at what would have been the apex towards the end of their career, and they could have certainly gone their whole lives without ever having met in battle. I know. That's a wild fact, huh? Wow. To interject, the Tokugawa and the Edo period are the same thing. Bingo. So Swords of the North Shire was not wrong. (laughs) I do believe you're right, ma'am. You can always count on hobbits. (laughs) Okay, Landon, you're up. So his fighting name was Ganru, which means large rock style. And he founded a school of swordsmanship named the same thing, large rock style. Now, see, that's weird. But it does segue me to the rock, our teacher, right? I wonder if Master Collegian would have been called Ganru. (laughs) <laughs> okay, Sasaki used a uh, nodachi, or a very long katana, and we will get into blades another time, and I cannot wait. Me too. It has been said that in the late 1500s, he dueled and won a battle against three opponents with a tessin, which is a fan. Which we do have a soft spot in our hearts for fans because I teach it. Yes. And a lot of people don't give fans credit for being one of the samurai weapons. But if you listen to our podcast, you know it was one of their 18 weapons. Okay, James, take this next one, please. That's okay. Right. This led to being named the chief weapons master of the Hosokawa thief. That's a and tongue twister. Are... Yes, it is. <laughs> <All right. laughs> These people, so, as smart as they were, they'd make their names a little easier, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and you have one too, right, Sensei Jackie? One of his nodachi or long swords, he called Momo Hoshizao, which meant the laundry drying bowl. Wow. Wow. Kind of he must have had a sense of humor about his long swords. You that think? That is funny. Okay. He is most famous by far and away for losing to Musashi on the remote island of Ganru Yujima of Funashima. But we are going to get back to that. Can I just say that that's... That is terrible that you're most famous for losing to somebody else. That's so bad. Good point. Wow. Unfortunately, yes. I I actually feel bad for him, too. I really do, because he really had major accomplishments. I mean, he had his own sword school. He was the, the chief weapons officer in someone else's territory. And this is where he goes down in history. Wow. Whenever you say, you said chief weapons officer and all i think is in like a corporate world (laughs) a chief weapons officer does not fit to me 
with your chief finance officer and your CEO. <laughs> and then you've just got the CWO, your chief weapons officer. <laughs> it evens the playing field. But I will say about um, that's great. Kojiro, part of his loss was his arrogance and his own temper and the well, fact that- Well, I don't know about arrogance because we weren't there. True. But his whole downfall was his lack of patience and his letting Musashi get under his skin. And Musashi was three hours late because he knew that he would get under the guy's skin by being three hours late. Now, how many of us have actually been to a meeting where someone was 30 minutes late? All of us, I'm sure. Right? Oh, Definitely. Absolutely. I'm trying to picture myself staying calm for three hours. And knowing that your life is on the line. Right. <laughs> and then again, then the fact that, so the story goes that Musashi came in tattered clothing, which Kojiro did not think was the right thing to wear for a, a death battle, that you should have been dressed the way he was dressed in all the fine clothing, the way it was done at that time. So in other words, it was psychosurgery to the bitter to end. To the bitter end, that's right. But anyway, we're way ahead of ourselves because now it is time to open up the door to Musashi Miyamoto, or Miyamoto Musashi, as we like to call him. And he is by far and away the most famous swordsman that I believe everybody who every martial artist knows his name that does Japanese martial arts. Don't you guys think? Us. Us. I think it's one of the first names we learned when we were talking about the history of martial arts. Of swordsmanship. Swordsmanship, yes. Not of martial arts because there's plenty of famous people there, but of swordsmanship. And I think a lot of modern day, like not modern day because we're in the new millennium here, but like Funakoshi. Yes. And Conroe? Conro. These are great martial arts people, but from the swordsman standpoint, I agree with you. Okay. He did have a lot of names here. He was born Miyamoto Masana. I also found that his family surname was Benasuki, which would have made him Miyamoto Benasuki. So your guess is as good as mine why there's two different conflicting records there. And in the end of his life, he had a Buddhist name, Niten Doraku. I find it so interesting how all of them had their Buddhist name. I think that's cool. Or whatever religion they finally turned to in the end. Us. Start me out with some facts, Landon. Uh, so he fought and he won his first battle at only the age of 13, which I think of is kind of crazy because I'm 12. And it's crazy that somebody already won their first battle close to my age and supposedly killed his opponent. So I find that very thought provoking. You know what? When I read that, it made me think so many different things. But first off, none of us at the age of 13 were in any kind of a mental state to take another person's life. Oh, definitely. Not. Either physically or mentally. You're agree in agreement with that, right, James? Us and say that's uh, I can't imagine myself as a 13 year old ready to fight somebody to the death. <laughs> but there are countries here today. Yes. There are countries where the war is so prevalent decade after decade, century after century, that children grow up in it. And therefore, they like it's part of their mental state. That's uh, all they know is from the time they're born till death is war exactly huh. that's that's all i when i when i went through that i really like i took a second and i thought about that and it it really like got to me to think of like a kid one year older than me already living in that state right it really is something it made me think too i have to say i really spent some time looking at that saying wow yikes mm -hmm. i don't want to share how i was at 13 but suffice it to say there was no killing involved <laughs> that's good news, I think. Hope not. I think, I think that that's okay. a good thing. Most historians agree, though, that his father was a swordsman. And he was called either Muni or Munisai. He was known as a master of the jute. And uh, for those of you who have not seen it, it's a single winged sai, which is a weapon that was used for the Japanese police to uh, catch a sword. The thing that I found really different than what my mind, I knew it was a police weapon, but I didn't think it was an ancient police weapon. But when I did do the research, it found its heyday in the Tokugawa period. Oh, oh. okay. Yeah. What I know the Sayas from our training is that they were used to poke holes in the ground as a farming tool. Right. The Saya originally came from the farming tool. You're absolutely right. But the jute 
um, became a really popular weapon, not unlike nunchucks or PR-24s are with police in modern times. But the thing that I found interesting was that it was popular in ancient times. Right. Which is... Uh, 1603 to 1867. Was or a, even the 1500s to the 1800s. Yes. Might have been more. And it was also once spelled J-I-T-T-E. So you might know it as Jite. That's also possible. I'm going to have to write that down, Sensei. The spelling of some of these words are always what gets me on tests. <laughs> oh, does he count spelling? We don't count spelling in my dojo. <laughs> no, we don't count spelling, but it's good to know. Uh, it is good to know. All right. What else you got over there that you want to share with us. Us. I found that his studies in swordsmanship were actually handled by his father and later by his uncle. Okay. So the romanticized version was that he was taught by Bukoden, but what you're saying is that he was actually taught by his father and later his uncle, which I think is even cooler. Us. It would have been kind of cool though, because Bukoden was already dead. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not opening that door. Okay, Landon, what do you got over there? All that's interesting reported that Musashi became a ronin, which is a wandering samurai who did not have a lord or master in around the 1600s. And he invented Ishiru, which is fighting with two swords, which if you've ever removed one sword, you know, fighting with two swords. Good Lord. Can you even picture that? A lot of strength and great eye-hand coordination. A lot of management. Yes. Uh, Here we are. His most famous and by some accounts, final fight. Okay. I did find one site that said he initiated a few battles after retirement. I did find a site that said that, even though everybody says Kojira was his last battle and that, and, and everybody says that he did move into a cave and did his thinking and his writing. But a few sites say that there is evidence that he came out and had a few battles, even in retirement. Yes. But the battle with Sasaki Kojiro took place in 1612. He arrived, he, Musashi, arrived three hours late, even though by all accounts, Kojiro and Musashi were equal in talent. Kojiro let the three hours late thing really get under his skin. And he was, as they say, blind with anger at Musashi's disrespectful action. Musashi had, after all, asked Kojiro's lord to arrange the battle. Anyway, using a boken, a wooden sword, Musashi hit Kojiro with a blow to the head, and it was over. It seems like an interesting strategy. I, I got a picture of a one-punch knockout at the beginning of round one in a boxing match from what, when you were just reading. Like, that was the image that came to my mind. The one person was just not paying attention, and they had a weakness, and the other person saw the weak. Also, Sensei Jackie, I think you said that Kojiro was also distracted by the fact that he showed up in the tattered clothing. How did you say that? Apparently, at the time, when samurai of the highest class were going to fight, they came with their retinue and they came in the finest clothes that they had for their battle. And that was the way it was done. But Musashi came in old, dirty, tattered clothes. And Kojiro thought that it was disrespectful to the battle. So he let all those things distract him from the battle. And there it is then. And we're back to Master Collegian and distractions. Yes, we are. This is a wonderful way to finish up this one because I truly believe that Master Collegian was somehow a warrior from hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and we were just lucky enough to get near it. That's correct. Uh, because he had a lot of individual traits. That's true. But he was a warrior, and he was not in any way, shape, or form above any kind of strategy. And that's what we said right here about Musashi. Any trick will work. And he did it. And he is the more famous of the two in death, partly because he was around long enough to write the different things that he wrote. But it is on that note that we're going to close this one out. So tune in next time because I'm for sure going to finish telling you all about Musashi, his book of five rings and so on and so forth. But if you have another subject that you're interested in us talking about, send it to me. You can send it to me at Dojo Conversations at AOL. You can send it to us on Facebook at Wildcat Dojo. You can get in touch with us on wildcatdojo.com, which is really what I recommend because there you can see pictures of all the different people that have been on the show. And I'm going to try to put one up with some different weapons on it for some of the people who might not know what the weapons look like. Excellent. Listen, and Sarah, that's really cool. Landon's favorite. Text or call <laughs> 954-350-1915. 1915. 
And James, I want to thank you so much for being in this episode. And I know you're going to stay to be in the next episode, right? Us and say, I'm happy to be here. Good. All right, guys, I'm going to close it out. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Signing off till next week. Thanks for being here. Hope you join us again next week on Wildcat Dojo Conversations.